for everyone. Thank Hello and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for registering and joining us today for this webinar on pediatric diagnosis and management of heritable aortic disorders with our guest speaker, Dr. Shane Morris. Um, I am Chrisanne Campos, from, uh, the science director from the Genetic Aortic Disorders Association of Canada. That's GADA Canada. And with me today co-hosting this webinar is Maura from UT Health, uh, co-hosting with me on behalf of the John Ritter Foundation for Aortic Health. Um, before I get into, uh, you know, introducing our guest speaker, I would just like to go through introductions about our organizations and, um, and a few housekeeping notes with a disclaimer for this webinar. So GADA Canada is a patient advocacy organization in Canada supporting genetic aortic disorders with a primary focus on promoting research, awareness, and education for these disorders. Uh, GADA has been supporting research for over 20 years, and some of the ongoing funded research uh, involves identifying risk factors associated with thoracic aortic disease in pregnancy, uh, identifying alternative uh, angiotensin receptor blockers to improve Marfan patient care, and identifying molecular mechanisms rel relevant to aortic aneurysm formation. Uh, recently, GADA also launched the Think Aorta Awareness Campaign in Canada uh, to promote timely diagnosis, treatment, and importantly, genetic testing for individuals with aortic dissections. GADA also funds the Montalcino Aortic Consortium, that's the MAC Aorta, which is an international uh, collaboration of aortic disease experts participating in a patient registry for precision medicine for genetic aortic disorders. MAC, um, as a patient registry research, for research, uh, enrolls patients who have had an aortic dissection or a family history of aortic dissection and a genetic di diagnosis underlying that aortic dissection. Uh, if anyone has uh, questions about GADA's programs or would like to participate in MAC, please feel free to email us at the email below. Hi, I will speak a bit on the John Ritter Foundation. Uh, I'm representing them today. So in case you do not know, the JRF is a nonprofit based in the United States. They really strive to support patients and families with thoracic aortic aneurysm and dissection. They do a bunch of different things, including funding aortic disease research, promoting patient education, and they also have a patient support program. They really do invite all of you to get plugged in with them. There will be a contact info slide coming up. So they invite you to go to the website, subscribe to their newsletter, follow them on social media to really get connected. It doesn't matter if you're in the US, if you're in Canada, if you're really anywhere, uh, they would love to really provide the resources that they can to you. I also want to bring up the disclaimer. So if you could take a couple moments to look over it, essentially just a reminder that this webinar is educational. So please do not make medical decisions or change your medical care um, based off of what you learned today. We really invite you to take what you learned today to your healthcare providers and discuss that with them. And then finally, just housekeeping rules. There are Q&A and chat buttons at the bottom of your screen. Please use those to ask any and all questions. Those will be addressed at the end of the talk. There are options to ask questions anonymously if that is what you prefer. And then always just be respectful, especially if you are chatting with other attendees. Right, so it is our privilege to have with us uh, today, Dr. our guest speaker, Dr. Shane Morris. Uh, Dr. Shane Morris is a pediatric cardiologist at the Texas Children's Hospital Baylor College of Medicine. Her area of expertise includes cardiovascular genetics, fetal cardiology, and cardiovascular imaging. Dr. Morris cares for patients 
with Marfan syndrome, Lewis Dietz syndrome, Turner syndrome, vascular Ehlers Danlos syndrome, and other genetic aortopathy conditions. Uh, she leads a multi center uh, aortopathy registry focused on aortopathy in the young called Clarity or Collaborative for Longitudinal Aortic Research in the Young. And she also sits on the steering committee for the Montalcino Aortic Consortium, facilitating a collaboration uh, for pediatric research for gene precision medicine, inheritable aortopathies. So, welcome, Dr. Morris. And I'll hand over this uh, session to you to present to our community. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Christiane and Mara. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and to speak with everyone. Um, I'm going to go through uh, some slides and presentation, but I look forward to questions at the end as well. And want to make sure that I address any questions that all people have. Um, you know, I could talk for 20 hours about pediatric uh, heritable aortic disease, so I tried to condense it into just a, a short presentation on some of the highlights, um, but I, I'd love to hear your questions afterwards. So the goals of this are to basically understand the scope of contemporary diagnosis of pediatric uh, hereditary thoracic aortic disease, which is also called connective tissue disease, which is also called aortopathy. I'll refer to it mostly as HTAD. And to understand for kids mostly, um, we've really been working on risk stratification in kids. So we know that more severe patients we need to pay a little closer attention to, but just as importantly, finding the lower risk kids so we can allow them to be more free and do more and not have so many restrictions. So first, I just want to talk about non-syndromic versus syndromic, um, you know, this, this kind of description that people use. Usually when people are talking about syndromic HTAD, they're talking about a group of signs, symptoms, characteristics that we find on imaging that may or may not have a genetic basis. And syndromic is basically not having these. So in aortopathy, classically, this is the facial phenotype that we see like in Marfan syndrome, Lois Dietz, arterial tortuosity syndrome, VEDS, and Turner syndrome. And I, I think it's very common to split aortopathies into syndromic versus non-syndromic, but I will make the argument that there's a lot of overlap and especially in children, this is a lot harder distinction. So we need to be very careful about that. So um, it, when we're looking at kids, we wanna be really careful uh, to do a thoughtful history and physical. We're of course looking at family history. Is there aneurysm, dissection, sudden death? Are there Marfanoid features that we can see like in Marfan and Lewis Dietz? We do look at the uvula, which is wide or split and about 20% of patients with Lewis Dietz pathway gene variants, but um, that's actually most 80% do not have that. We look for soft skin. That's really, really common in most of these conditions. You know, I can almost go up to someone and tell if they have something based on their skin. But one thing is kids with um, uh, HTAD may have a completely normal examination. Outside the heart exam and the skin exam, we might also notice other histories like hernias, constipation, lung disorder, skeletal issues. So this is, you know, classic, you guys might know this young woman who uh, volunteers with the Marfan Foundation, but, you know, she has Marfan syndrome, has a lot of the classic features. She's tall and thin, has glasses. And I think a lot of physicians are trained to look for kids like this and not to see all the other populations can be affected with HTAD, but they certainly can and can look a lot more subtle. Um, so what does syndromic mean when we're looking at a child? I will say that you know, for example, in Marfan syndrome, there's something called the Ghent criteria. And one of these is the systemic score, but it's based on teenagers and adults. It's not based on young kids. So this was a beautiful paper from uh, Dr. Roman, who's an adult cardiologist. And she looked through the GenTAC data, which was a large NIH registry, at what ages, at what percent of features were present at different ages. So for example, they looked at aortic root dilation and this is under age seven, this is seven to 10, and this is 11 to 15, this is in kids. And you can see that aortic root dilation is present throughout, right? That doesn't seem to change with age. And I agree with that. I can see aortic root dilation in a fetus. I can see it in a one day old if we get an echo, if they have, Mar this is specifically Marfan syndrome, but this also goes with most of the other aortic conditions. But if you look at ectopia lentis, that's lens sublocation or dislocated lenses, you know, it's it creeps up as you get older. Same with pectus. This is where the chest caves in. Same with pectus carinatum, where it caves out. It gets worse as you get older, especially in puberty. Um, and when you look at both of these, so we have to remember that a lot of these other features that we look at 
if you're looking at a one-year-old or a three-year-old, they may not be there. And that doesn't mean they don't have an HCAD. We really need to look at the cardiac features, which are almost universally there. If you look for them carefully and you're looking at someone who knows how to look in young people. These are some other features. You can see arachnodactyly, which is long, thin fingers. Again, we're talking specifically about Marfan syndrome. You know, it's much less likely to be present in a child, even if they ultimately have a diagnosis of Marfan syndrome. Same with scoliosis, same with stretch marks, same with mitral valve prolapse. So almost all of these get worse with age. So you have to be thoughtful about diagnosing a young person that we're not looking for the same criteria. So Lois Dietz is a lot of these, um, syndrome, these Lois Dietz pathway genes represent a lot of these um, quote unquote syndromic uh, HTADs. And so the minority have the classic features that are in the papers. So that's bifid uvula, hypertelers, and that's when the eyes are spaced out really far. Craniosynostosis, this is when the sutures in the head are uh, abnormally, stay abnormally closed, club foot. And these are like the classic features, but that's actually a very small proportion that have these classic features. Now, some of the other features emerge with age, like the long skinny fingers, pectus, scoliosis, cervical instability. And so again, young children with these HTAD genes, may, you may not see any of this and they still may have the genetic variant. So it's really important that you're you know, getting evaluated by someone who's aware of this, um, also hernias and neurolactasia. So um, it's not uncommon to find a child who only has joint hypermobility and flat feet, and then they also have aortic dilation and you work them up and they have a causative pathogenic variant. It's so different than adults. So, um, and do we call this patient syndromic? You know, I would say most people would say, well, someone that has joint hypermobility and flat feet is not syndromic, but, you know, by the time they're 19, they probably will look very syndromic. So we just have to be kind of thoughtful about that. And that's a whole different mantra. If you talk to most pediatric cardiologists or adult cardiologists, they really were, were trained to look for all of these features, but I'll say we really need to look more at the imaging pictures, the cardiac pictures to make an early diagnosis. And the question is, would they be missed without an echocardiogram or other imaging? Um, I don't know how many people on the call have been through this, but I've seen tons of patients who sort of were seen by a specialist. They said, well, you look fine. I don't think you have anything. And then did not get a diagnosis. And then years later, they got an imaging study of the heart that was abnormal and that triggered the ultimate diagnosis, which happens all the time. So I will say it's kind of like this. Like if you have a, this is just a, you know, a chart is the age goes up your syndromic findings also go up. And if you, so if you took a slice, like say we took a slice and this is zero to age two, and you say what proportion of the population with age had would be syndromic versus non-syndromic, it's probably, you know, it's small when you're young because it's harder to tell. And then it goes up. And by the time, you know, you're an older teen or an older adult, much more proportion of syndromic. And, and you could say even the majority of these might have Marfan syndrome or might have Lewis Dietz but the syndromic features get worse with age. And, you know, I wish it was this clear cut, but it's really more like this, right? It's just kind of fuzzy. So we just have to really be thinking about that and getting a careful exam. All right, so let's talk about the actual genes. So the syndromic genes that are most commonly cause HTAD um, are of course, FBN1 and Marfan syndrome, the genes that cause the Lewis Dietz, uh, different syndromes, arterial tortuosity, of course, VEDS, the collagen 3A1 gene, ACTA2, um, which can cause uh, SMDS or can cause kind of a, a, a less severe form of aortic dilation. And Turner syndrome, the syndromic form is SMDS. And then we have the classic non-syndromic genes. However, I will say in reality, it's more like this. These genes can certainly present as syndromic or non-syndromic. I will say I haven't seen anyone at, well, Turner's can look pretty non-syndromic early, but so something to think about is that all of these genes should be on any kind of workup um, when you're talking about testing now. So in what's changed is the physical exam is no longer a discriminator about whether or not to perform genetic testing. If you see aortic dilation in a child that's consistent, it's there more than one echocardiogram or it's moderate or severe, um, they should probably have genetic testing just based on aortic dilation, unless there's another clear cause. And we can go through, real, you know, there's time at the end, other clear causes of aortic dilation, like chronic hypertension, renal dysfunction, uh, fetal lupus. But um, other than that, nowadays we would test for just the presence of aortic dilation.
So this was a really interesting study. This was a beautiful study done by the French group, and they looked at non-syndromic, uh, very non-syndromic cases, and this included children, and, and looked at and did genetic testing, and the vast majority of them had syndromic gene causes. So just an interesting point. So what do we do with testing uh, if you have aortic dilation? So you have aortic dilation, what the heck do we do? So this was, we did a national survey of pediatric providers across the United States and said, well, what if you come in and you bring in a child who has an aortic Z score of three, which is mildly dilated, that's a little bit above normal, what percent of people would either do testing or refer to genetics versus not, would not do that versus other? And if you look, the green bar is like what knocked them over again, in addition to dilation. So if they have just bicuspid valve and dilation, a very small proportion would test because bicuspid valve causes dilation and it's usually not genetic that we can find. So this is very small, but if you add, um, if you add mitral valve prolapse, if you add pectus, if you add family history, uh, you know, then that really pushes you over where virtually everyone, if there's a family history, will do testing. So the vast majority of people will do testing in children if you have dilation plus one other thing, or and a fair number will do dilation even alone as long as you don't have bicuspid valve. So when what age should we test at? So there's variable opinions. I don't know of any research on this, but I will give you my opinion having practiced in this field for a long time. And I think the younger, the better for mental health. Now, I've heard the argument made that, you know, I don't want them to have, deal with this as a kid. I want them to have a nice childhood and I'm going to tell them when they can handle it, you know, when they're 12, 13, 15, 16, whatever. I will say I, I that is how I started my career. And it is completely traumatic to kind of have an identity, to identify, to have a love of a certain sport and to have a love of a certain identity. And then for that all to change, especially as an adolescent. And I've seen so many kids encounter major mental health issues with the loss of identity when that happens in the teen years. It's really disruptive um, and it's really hard versus the kids I see that knew from a very young age, it just is part of who they are. And you can guide them if they have a particular condition that has sports restrictions or activity restrictions or chronic medications, you can guide them early and that's just who they are. And it's not like, they're the star football player who now has to stop and doesn't have something they're passionate about. Or they're the person who always wants to go skydiving as soon as they turn 15 and now can never do that again. Um, I think the earlier you can tell them, the better. Additionally, multiple trials show that medication is more effective at young ages. Now that has only been done, the trials are all in Marfan syndrome because that's the biggest cohort that we've been able to do randomized trials in. But every single one that has looked at age says the earlier you start, the more effective, the more bang for your buck you get. So I think, I mean, from my perspective, you know, like I would test at birth. Now, I don't, you know, you don't have to run when they're one day old. It's okay if you're a couple of months or three months old. But if you have a suspicion, I would test early because it can just be, they can be part of who they are and you can get medication started early. Um, you know, of course, we always have this discussion with the family that are open to what they want to do. There's not an urgency between a few months, you know, but I, but I don't think waiting till teen years uh, helps anybody. So going through the heart problems, I know a lot of you already know this. We're just going to go through some of the issues we do see when we're taking care of kids and they're the same as adults. So first of all, um, you know, the aorta, the center part, this thoracic aorta is the most affected, but depending on the HTAD, lots of the other arteries can be involved, especially in conditions like the low deep syndrome or VEDS, where you can have any part of the arterial system involved. Um, most commonly is here at the root or the ascending aorta. This is a patient with Marfan syndrome. They often get this dilation at the distal aorta as well. It, it, we call it, this is the isthmus. Um, and this is the opposite. You guys may not know about this, but there's a condition called Williams syndrome, and they actually get narrowing at these two areas, the same place where in Marfan and Levisita we get dilation, they get narrowing here, and it's a different kind of aerotopathy with small vessels. So, um, and what's the difference between, sometimes people interchangeably use aneurysm versus dissection versus rupture, and aneurysm is just where it's stretched out like this as a balloon, this is a root dilation, this is uh, ascending dilation. So it's just stretched. It doesn't cause um, any, any uh, pain at all. Now in adults, we call it an aneurysm. In kids, we rarely use the word aneurysm unless we're trying to get insurance to cover something. 
because this has so much of a bad connotation, like it's going to rupture. We usually refer to it as dilation. And that's just like a traditional pediatric thing because it's so rare to have dissection or rupture in children. We usually refer to this as dilation. And we might say mild, moderate, severe dilation, but these are basically used interchangeably. Now a dissection, and again, I know a lot of you know this, is where there's a partial tear. So there's three layers of the aorta. And if one or two of the layers tears and allow blood to come in and cause this next lumen, that's a dissection. A rupture is where you go through and through. So um, ruptures are pretty rare, except in um, vascular EDS or in dissections that kind of haven't been recognized. But um, the dissection is much more common where it comes into this lumen, causes two pathways of blood. This can cause two problems. It can cause a risk of a rupture of this wall, but it can also occlude the blood flow in the aorta or the other small vessels and cause stroke-like symptoms or lack of blood flow to certain organs. So that's what we're trying to prevent, even in kids. It's rare in kids, but for sure it can happen. So the challenge, um, aortic disease is being increasingly recognized, which is great in kids due to better genetic testing, due to more awareness in the community. Um, and even though outcomes like dissection are rare, out dissections are actually increasing. Probably it was happening before and people weren't doing the testing and we're recognizing it as dissection now. So this is um, a paper that we are about to submit. This is Texas data. We're looking at hospitalizations for aortic dissection. This is under 40, so this isn't all children. This is under age 40. And this is per 1 million people in the population. And even though we're doing a better job preventing aortic dissection, we think the numbers are going up, which is really interesting. And I think a lot of this is recognition. So this is, leads to lots of questions, like who is low risk versus high risk? How often should we do imaging? What's the best medical regimen? When should we do surgery? So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I just mentioned the aorta. I will say there are other heart problems in HTAD or connective tissue disorders. These are more in the syndromic features. We can have mitral valve prolapse or tricuspid valve prolapse. This is the heart on its side. This is the left atrium. This is left ventral. This is mitral valve. Usually it should make more like a V and it's kind of making like this, almost like a line here. And that this part of the leaflet is popping up. That's mitral valve prolapse. That can cause the valve to leak and have issues over time. We can have something called mitral annular disjunction. I can talk about this later if someone wants. It's kind of a newly discovered where that this patient doesn't have it here, but where this mitral leaflet is attached kind of a little higher than it should be. It should be attached right here on the left ventricular wall. It's attached higher and can be associated with dysfunction of the ventricle or arrhythmias. Um, the pulmonary arteries can be dilated. We look for that. There, the function of the ventricles, the heart muscle can be down. And there are congenital heart defects we can see in these by cuspid aortic valve, most commonly seen in the Lewis Dietz syndromes. ASD can be seen in all of them. VSD can be seen in filament A and Lewis Dietz, PDA and all the smooth muscle genes, especially ACTA2, and coarctation is common in um, SMDS um, and some and uh, arterial tortuosity syndrome. So we also want to look as we're doing our assessment of kids like this. We've looked at the mutations, we've looked at the aorta, we've looked outside the aorta. Are there aneurysms outside the root or ascending? So these are some pretty pictures where we've looked, and you can see this patient has that same thing I showed you earlier: dilation of the isthmus. Um, you know, we want to always look for that to see if there's anything we need to do. This is another patient who has these twisty vessels. Um, so we call this arterial tortuosity, and we want to look for this because this can be. Um, a marker of more severe disease. And if you look here, where I've shown the funny yellow arrow, this is a patient of mine, only 17 years old, but has a dissected aneurysm in the subclavian artery. So we want to, we wouldn't see this on an echocardiogram. So we want to make sure that we're doing surveillance. He had no idea, had no symptoms and had this uh, dissection of an artery here. Um, this is another really large aneurysm that was picked up in one of our Lois Dietz patients. He just said, oh, I feel a little pulsation in my neck and have this, this bulge here as a big, um, arterial aneurysm. So we want to be sure we're looking for those. This is an interesting patient. We don't know what the diagnosis is, had mild aortic dilation, but has all these aneurysms down in the abdomen and pelvis. Uh, all this, 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 all these, and all these are aneurysms. And we're not sure what this patient, this patient had negative, uh, very comprehensive testing, but we want to be looking for those. So um, historically, you know, what we used to do for kids that had connective tissue disorders or HTAD, is we used to look, and I will say this has all changed. We used to look and say, do you look like you have Marfan syndrome? And if if it was no, um, we'd say, have a nice day. If it was yes, we might get an echo. 
And then we might say, okay, well, do you have a high score? Like I mentioned earlier. And if they look syndromic, then we might do genetic testing. But if not, we probably wouldn't. It's pretty expensive. And if there was a lot of dilation or syndromic, we might do medical, we might do medical treatment. We might not. And we usually use one medication. And we usually did did not do surgery before five centimeters. I will say almost all of this has changed and based on some of the things I discussed with you. So first of all, this, the, the exam no longer dictates the testing. Certainly it can make you guess, like I think this patient has Marfan or SMDS or VEDS, but you have to be thoughtful about the testing um, and recognize that a lot of features don't show up in young kids. We um, The syndromic features should not dictate the imaging, the genetics and the cardiac presentation should. And genetic testing now, we're going to talk about in a second, is much less costly and in the U.S. is less than the cost of one echocardiogram. So certainly should be done. Um, and medical treatment, we're going to, we use a lot more. And I'm going to briefly talk about dual therapy in some patients and um, surgery in some patients before four and a half centimeters. And I, I will say this is a plug. I couldn't discuss it in detail today, but the American Heart Association has agreed to... Um, publish a guidance statement, a scientific statement on care of the child with aortopathy. And I'm one of the authors and that is coming out any day now. So we, we will have a published statement on all of the, on all of these items. So what are the, if we're taking care of a patient and you're trying to say, how are we gonna take care of this child? We really need to take into account what's this patient's risk of aortic arterial dissection. Do we need to worry about other conditions? Do we need to refer them to a pulmonologist or a psychologist or a surgeon of some sort? Um, do we think there's extra cardiac disease, heart disease, outs I mean, disease outside the heart? Do we think we need to give medicines? Is this a patient we need to start medicine on? Is this a patient we need to refer to surgery and why? So first, when we look, we wanna, we really wanna know the genetics and the phenotype. So these are three patients. These are cat, all three CAT scans. These are of the aorta. This candy cane shaped looking thing is the aorta. If you see in all three of these, and the, this is the rest of the heart. And you can see in all of these, they have kind of this area, this root and ascending is dilated in all of them. These two are a little more in the ascending and uh, this one's a little more in the root. And they all have kind of some twisty tortuous vessels. But if we do the genetic testing, they're super different. This patient has Marfan syndrome. We know this patient has a 200 fold risk of aortic dissection at some point in their life than your random person walking down the sidewalk. Whoops, sorry. This person has notch one, which is a variant that does cause bicuspid aortic valve, but notch one doesn't increase your risk, bicuspid valve does, but this person has about a 10 times risk of aortic dissection. And this patient has what used to be called DeGeorge syndrome, but now it's called 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome. And they have a, a congenital heart disease with aortic dilation and they virtually never dissect. So we really wanna know what's the genetic cause of the aortic dilation to manage them. This patient, no matter what we do, they're probably never gonna have a tear. And this patient, we need to be really thoughtful about their care to prevent one. So these are just some other examples of four different patients who all have aortic dilation and some degree of tortuosity, but are very different. This patient has filament A deficiency. They do dissect, but not nearly as high as some other patients. This patient has arterial tortuosity syndrome and a bicuspid aortic valve. Um, they can get really big aneurysms. They can have really tortuous vessels, but there's never been an aortic dissection or arterial dissection reported to date. This is ACTA2, diffuse aortic dilation. They have a high risk of tearing. And this is SMDS, the most severe form. So we have to watch them really closely, have a lot of neurologic, neurovascular side effects. We wanna recognize it right away. And this is Lewis Dietz syndrome type four. Um, this is actually a patient who's, this is the, transverse arch here. This is the spine. This is a tear. So this is a patient with it who already came to us actually with an aortic dissection who we have to be thoughtful about who had a very similar phenotype. So we really want to look at the phenotype and the genotype together to come with managing. And basically the genetic testing in the U.S., like I mentioned before, is currently less expensive than a single echocardiogram. Um, if it's often covered by insurance, if it's, if it's not, a lot of these commercial companies either can also do it um, out of pocket for uh, very low cost and often have a sliding scale. These are just some examples. There's tons of companies that do testing, but um, it is much easier than 10 years ago to get genetic testing for these conditions. And it really, really, really dictates care. So it's critical. Um, because like I said, the risk, the gene, what I showed you in this picture is the gene determines risk. So I put kind of the highest risk patients are here for having a dissection or rupture. 
Then we kind of go down to moderate risk. We go to some risk, but this is almost always in adults. And then risk that we think is probably not elevated compared to the, the uh, regular population. So just aortic dilation doesn't help you, but you need both. Now, this is a beautiful paper done by MAC, the MAC Consortium supported by GATA, led by Dr. Regalado and senior author, Dr. Milowicz. I report to this paper almost every day. What this paper showed beautifully is the gene matters, but the variant also matters. So this is a, um, a graph, I'll orient you in a second. This is age along the x-axis. This is risk of an aortic event, like proportion of the population that's had an aortic event on the y-axis, and each line is a different gene. So these are all the different um, Lois Dietz family genes. And basically the higher you are, the worse you are. So if you did a line at age 20, you can see like 20% of people with TGFBR2 variant have already had an aortic event, but basically zero or maybe 1% of people with a SMAD3 variant have had an event. And by the time we get to 60, we're up to 75% of people with a TGFBR2 variant. It's called the Kaplan-Meier curve. And so this was a beautiful paper because it showed that the gene really matters when you're counseling someone for risk at what age they might have an event. What was really neat is then it looked into specific variants. You know, each of these variants has a specific misspelling that a family might carry. This is specifically looking at ACTA2, one of the smooth muscle genes. These are all different common variants. And you see there's a dramatic difference. This arginine 179 variant, that's the uh, uh, SMDS, you know, starting at around age 10, really high risk of having, you know, by the time you're 20, you're almost at 100% risk of having an aortic event between 10 and 20. But if you're kind of over here, this, this glycine 160 substitution, you know, even by the time you're 60 or 70, only about 40% of people have had to have aortic surgery or had an aortic dissection. So as someone's helping manage you or manage a family, they really need to know the gene affected, the way that it looks, and also the specific variant to help manage. This is We've known this for years in VEDS that um, the type of variant matters, where the variant is, and actually even within glycine substitution, which is the most common mutation or variant in VEDS, what glycine is substituted with matters. And these are more, these are the opposite of the curves I just showed you. This is like a cumulative hazard, so it adds up risk over time. This is the opposite, it's called the survival curve. So everyone starts alive and it's what percent of the population is still alive. So in these curves, the lower you are, the worse. So you can see that the splice donor site kind of has the most aggressive um, events. And in this, it's not aortic, it's aortic or arterial events. So what about surgical thresholds? So these, I cannot show you the pediatric uh, statement yet, but it will be coming out soon. These are, this is the adult statement and I will say, um, in pediatrics, we follow pretty closely to the adult uh, statement. This is one just published in 2022 that all providers should have access to. But what they have is they have these beautiful tables. They'll have the gene variant and they'll have when you should operate. And basically like, for example, ACTA2, if you're high risk ACTA2, which is certain variants or family history, then we operate at a smaller dimension than if you're a low risk ACTA2. We also have this for PRG1. There are tables like this for all the lowest D genes as well and for Marfan. So it's really nice that these tables exist to help guide when we're going to operate on the aorta. So one thing that I get asked a lot about in pediatrics is what about this Z-score? So people might know that um, because kids are a range of sizes, when we get an aorta, we always Z-score it. So we say, how big is it in relation to your body? So, um, you know, a, a Z-score of zero is normal. A Z-score of two is two standard deviations above the mean, so it's dilated, and some people want to operate on Z-scores. So sort of interesting data. This is really old data from Sada Tierney at Stanford. And this is another similar um, group more recently done. But they have Z-score along the Y-axis and age along the left, and you can each line is a person. The Z-score doesn't really change over time. You might start dilated and stay dilated. And so unfortunately, you see even these really severe patients, we can't follow Z-score to when to operate because like two-year-olds don't dissect. So even if you have a Z-score of 10, we're not gonna operate. We really do go off the raw dimension, you know, three centimeters, four centimeters, five centimeters. Uh, we look at the Z-score though to help us with meds. How dilated are you? So how aggressive do we need to be with meds? This is a similar group of patients. It's just showing that the Z-score, these are the patients stays fairly stable over time. It doesn't increase over time. So your most patients that have aortic dilation are born with aortic dilation and it stays like that. It, it just grows with you 
as your body grows and then grows with age. So what about medication in kids? Um, so there have been multiple trials. Um, I will, I'll give you kind of the, the short version. So there were, there's been over eight trials looking at two different groups of medicines, beta blockers and angiotensin receptor blockers. And basically based on all these trials, no trial is perfect, but it seems like monotherapy with either of them, that's single therapy does slow rate of aortic dilation in children. And the younger you start it, the better. Um, and there was a recent beautiful, um, this paper is a beautiful, what's called the individualized meta-analysis. They took eight of the trials and they put all the data together and, and analyzed it. And it also showed that comp dual therapy using an ARB with uh, a beta blocker, this is in Marfan syndrome because the only cohort that we've studied it in actually works better than either alone. So um, most people, if there's moderate or more dilation, will use dual therapy, at least in Marfan and Lois Dietz syndrome. So monotherapy, single therapy for mild, maybe even in people with borderline dilation. And then a lot of people are moving to dual therapy. And we finally have good evidence in this um, uh, meta-analysis. And the earlier you start, the more effective it is, the more it slows aortic dilation. None of these trials showed an effect on dissection because there were not enough dissections in all these patients who were really well cared for. So they didn't have enough, we call it power to get there. So um, how should the, the differing risks by gene alter medical and surgical management? Well, if there's not a risk of dissection, we may not give medication. So filament A, you know, there's only a few risks of dissection. I think most of us will treat these patients but patients with congenital heart disease, with 22Q deletion syndrome, arterial tortuosity syndrome, almost no reported cases. So most people, even if you have a huge aorta, will not give medication to these patients. We're giving it to people with Marfan syndrome, NACT2, and VEDS because we know they have risk of tearing. But if you don't have risk of tearing, we probably don't need to put kids on meds. So um, one other thing is exercise. So I think as a pediatric community, We've been way too restrictive with exercise and we're almost done. So last, I think oh, I've got a couple more things to talk about. Um, this is a classic, this is a chart from the Bethesda guidelines. Sorry, it showed up so blurry. It looked better in my prior slide, but where they put like the increasing static component, this is like the bearing down component, increasing dynamic, this is how much you're moving. And they grade it. Like this is the highest static plus uh, dynamic. And this is the lowest static, lowest dynamic. For years, the guidelines have said, okay, if you have aortic dilation, you can do this stuff. And maybe you can do this stuff if you're really mild. And I think that's led to a lot of kids being really sedentary, a lot of over restriction. And so benefits, obviously we know there's cardiovascular health, mental health, strength, community building, coordination and confidence. Um, and the concerns are that, well, could exercise worse than the aneurysm? Could it cause joint or eye damage? And these beautiful papers, a couple of papers came out um, really nicely looking at a mouse model of Marfan syndrome and putting them under exercise. And basically the mice that had moderate exercise actually had better cardiovascular benefits with no damage to the aorta. So this allowed us to do some human studies which are ongoing, which are super exciting. This is a project that we've been working on. We did a pilot. We took 20 kids during the pandemic. We gave them a training, a remote training uh, regimen and uh, to look at their aorta, they all had Marfan syndrome and basically had no change in the aorta group. And then, um, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. This 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 graph in the back is another one done out of Stanford looking at walking. And then we did one um, in our patients and basically showed that stress levels went down, the exercise fitness went up and aortic root dimension did not go down. And we're currently doing a randomized controlled trial. If anyone has Marfan syndrome and wants to enroll, you can reach out to me because we're still enrolling. We're enrolling 50 patients between us and Stanford. And we've done about 20 so far. So these are our these are from our pilot. You get the max VO2 is basically fitness level that went up, stress scores went down, root dimension. This is pre and post here. Sorry, this is baseline. This is at the end. Did not change. Systolic blood pressure went down. Diastolic pressure kind of went down, except in one person. Lastly, I just wanted to for a couple of minutes talk about a biomarker called arterial tortuosity. That's the twistiness of the vessels. Historically, it was described in Lewis Dietz, but we see it in most of the aortopathies. And um, we can measure it. You can measure this in 3D space, measure the crow's flight and take that ratio of the percent excess. And that gives us something called the tortuosity index. These are the vertebral arteries, the neck arteries, that's a common place we measure it. And you can see this is, this is low disease type two, this is Turner syndrome, arterial tortuosity syndrome, 
uh, low Zs type four, Marfan, we see it in all of these. And we basically, this is another one of these survival curves that if you have high tortuosity, you're more likely to have a type A dissection at a younger age. Oops. Here, and this is just a mathematical way of showing that uh, even when you adjust for the gene, having tor high tortuosity is important. And we get that tortuosity from a MRI or a CAT scan. This is another paper. This is from a, a Dutch trial of um, low sartan, but they looked back at the data and said, oh, well, let's look at who had aortic tortuosity. This is the whole aorta. They did the same thing, long distance uh, under divided by short distance. And those with more tortuosity had more dissection. So it's a, we call it a biomarker somewhere to predict who's going to be more fragile. And interesting in tortuosity, this is one big family that all have low seeds type four. And, um, but two of the men dissected and a bunch of women did not. And some of the men did not. And we basically showed that this, the bigger the aorta, the higher their tortuosity was. And the two that had high tortuosity dissected and the rest didn't. So it's not just genotype. Also within a family, the tortuosity can be helpful. So something to look at too, that you can get on a CT or MRI. And we do look at that in children as well. So basically in summary, the knowledge has dramatically changed in the last decade for taking care of kids with HTAD. Uh, genetic testing is now standard of care, uh, really guides management. Um, and the variant can really help guide management as well. We wanna look at the aortic phenotype, the way the aorta looks and the presence of arterial tortuosity to help guide management. And new adult guidelines are out. We really like them. They're much more personalized than before. And a pediatric statement is coming out any day. And I will be thrilled to talk about it once it's out. I think that's it. Lastly, I just wanted to mention Clarity. I know it was mentioned at the beginning. This is our pediatric collaborative for longitudinal imaging in the young. We work in complete collaboration with MAC, which you've already heard about. This is sort of like the pediatric enriched arm with lots of images. And um, these are where all of our sites are, but we're recruiting and happy to talk about it more. And these are our funding sources. Thank you guys. Sorry, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Morris, uh, for this great information you presented through the talk. Um, <clears throat> I know there are no pediatric guidelines, so just shedding this information, you know, research-based information on management of heritable aortic disorders uh, is very helpful uh, for patients as well as physicians. Uh, there's a question. We received tons of questions through registration, so we'll try to get through most of the questions if we can. Uh, um, uh, but if we don't, I just want everyone to know that they can send in their questions by email to GADA or the JRF, and we'll try and address them with Dr. Morris if needed. There's a question here from a pediatric cardiologist in Canada asking, how often do you perform a full-body MRI in in search of systemic aneurysms in heritable thoracic aortic disease patients? And when do you start? Would you put a baby through a, a GA or a radiation for CT to have a full body assessment? And if so, how often? So such a good question. I think for most patients, we'll do it by age three because under three is when, you know, sedation has been associated with adverse events in large populations, like where we think, you know, you don't want to do elective sedation under three, unless they're very severe. Like if it's SMDS, which is the ACTA2 R179, if it's an aggressive form of VEDS, if it's an aggressive form of low esteets like a TGFBR2, we would do it at diagnosis, head to pelvis. Otherwise, we'll usually do it around age three, unless they're very mild, like SMAD3, which is a really mild form right. of low esteets. We might wait till they're like 12. Right. We'll do it once, head to pelvis. If we see nothing, we do it every few years, depending on the severity of the disease. Um, for kids that are over nine, you know, will use MRIs routinely because they don't need to be sedated. But between birth and nine, we'll talk with the parents whether they want a fast study with, we can often do a CAT scan without radiation. I mean, not a baby, but that can be very fast, you know, 20 seconds, or we want to do no radiation, but do sedation. So we'll, we'll talk through both, but we try to judiciously use it, nothing like the adults where we do it every year. Right. Yeah. So on that note, there's a question on SMAD3. So if it, it, if, if uh, the parent has a SMAD3, but not, you know, a typical, uh, you know, later onset of uh, aortopathy, uh, would, would you recommend later testing then in that case? You know, it's certainly a family's preference, but I would do the testing early because it is a range, right? Most of my SMAD3s 
have borderline dilation, but certainly I have a handful of SMAD threes that have moderate dilation and they're not likely to dissect, but if you put them on meds, if you can start adulthood at two and a half centimeters instead of three and a half centimeters, you're probably a lot later, it's a lot later in life that you're gonna need an aortic repair. And we think that chronically that might help the arterial wall. And, you know, at least you're checking in every few years, there tends to be dramatic aortic growth at puberty. And if you know, maybe you get checked at nine and then you get checked again at 12 or 13 and then at 15 or 16, just to make sure there's not greater growth than you think. It's true, the vast majority of SMAD threes are totally fine in childhood, but at least to have a gauge on what that is to make sure you're not an outlier. Yeah. And I would wait before, I would not wait till they're 18 just because, I mean, being totally honest, like people don't always wait to have sex till they're 18. And you know, these are autosomal dominant. You have 50% chance of passing them to children. And I talk to my teens all the time. Like, you know, you don't want to deal with having to think about this if you happen to be involved in a pregnancy and you should know you have this. And sometimes it'll just influence them to be thoughtful if they're sexually active. That's a great point. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, you know, knowing it early and, uh, Diagnosing early and then knowing your the decisions and having informed decisions through life is is very crucial. Thank you so much, Dr. Morris. This is such a great talk. Uh, very important. Another question that we have, and maybe you could speak a little bit more on syndromic versus non-syndromic. I have uh, someone in the audience who basically generations of the family have aneurysms um, and dissections. Uh, they had a genetic test 13 years ago that came back with a VUS. And so essentially uh, it doesn't specify whether there are you know, pediatric patients involved. This patient wants to know if the VUS has anything to do with like syndromic or non-syndromic presentation? Does the VUS lend toward it being one of those or is there not? Well, yeah, I'm happy to talk about it. So the VUS doesn't have anything to do with syndromic or non-syndromic. That just tells you whenever we get a gene variant. So for example, ACTA2 tends to be non-syndromic and Marfan tends to be syndromic. Um, and one is called by FBN1, one's called by ACTA2. A, anytime you get a gene variant, there's kind of five ways you can code it. Benign, likely benign, un VUS variant of uncertain significance, likely pathogenic, pathogenic. And there's like a certain score criteria. And to be pathogenic, it has to have been reported in other people, or it has to be really clear in your family that it's causing disease. There has You have to have really strong criteria. And a VUS just means that it's an it's probably in a suspicious gene or a suspicious place, but there's not enough evidence to say it's really causing the disease. But um, and so it certainly could be causing the disease, and you you might be the first family that has it, or maybe it's a change. It's kind of like putting margarine instead of butter in your in, in a recipe, except in your genes, like it's not causing a problem at all. So those just have to be followed up. I will say, if the, your testing was 13 years ago, 1,000% get retested because we know so much more than we knew 13 years ago. And that VUS might get reclassified or we might find another variant that is causing the um, the sections in your family. Thanks, that's great. I know VUSs can be just confusing and not the sort of desired result because they do leave a lot of gray area. Yes, yeah, so on that note, uh, Dr. Morris, so if how do you manage patients at risk if they have a positive genotype but a negative phenotype um, and a family history? Uh, yeah. um, what's what's the screening, you know, the age for screening and, and surveillance basically in these patients? It really depends on the disease. For example, in Marfan and Lois Dietz, before they tear, they're always going to get an ascending, like a root aneurysm, right? That that you always see that before they have a dissection, almost almost always. So those patients, if they're, you know, we'll follow them every one or two years. We'll get a picture of their root and we'll see if they're dilated. Now, you know, we don't we define dilation in children's as a Z score above two point zero. But a lot of families we follow, they're like one point seven, so they're like ninety fifth percentile, right? So we might actually give medications in those patients just to get them, because your aorta grows the fastest during childhood, just to get them to start adulthood at a nice age. And those people we'd follow yearly. If someone really has a Z-score of zero, we might see them yearly. And um, and we may not give them medication. Now it's different than like ACTA2. They can get minimal dilation. They can get a type. I just had a young man, a 14 year old, have a near lethal type B dissection with no aortic dilation whatsoever. And so we have to, you know, depend and VEDS, clearly most people with VEDS 
do not have aortic dilation and have and have um, when they have ruptures or dissections. And so it really depends on the genotype it, that that informs how closely we're following them, if, if that makes sense. Right. Yes, that that does make sense. So if if um, what would be the surveillance if the genotype of the parents is uninformative, if they don't know the genotype? Well, so then usually our default is to treat it like Marfan syndrome. I mean, and okay. which is sort of, you know, and you, and the severity, like if we, if the child's not dilated at all, then, you know, usually it's every two to three years. We'll see, um, unless a family has been, had a really scary family history, but the aorta grows really slowly. Like the average growth of the aorta in a child is one and a half millimeters a year. So if you do any less than a year, then, but the, the resolution of a CT or MRI is about one millimeter. So if you go less than a year in someone who's slow growing, it's going to be really hard to tell if there's been a change. Now, and certainly in aggressive cases, we'll certainly see them every six months or in babies, we'll see them every three months. But um, usually if the, if they're genotype positive, phenotype negative, if it's high risk every year, maybe, and if it's, if, if it's kind of low risk, we don't know, then every two yeah. years just with an echo, you know, just to look at that. Yeah. So this question is pretty specific, but just interest in, have you seen cases, um, individuals with active two variants, any babies with prune belly syndrome, um, not SMDS though, any other variants, if you know of any? I mean, I have seen lots of prune belly syndrome for different causes because I specialize in fetal cardiology and those usually get picked up fetally, but not with aortic. I have never personally seen it with aortic disease or with ACTA2, but you know, that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, but I have not seen it. Right. Uh, and I know you've, you've already touched on getting retested, genetic retesting, if you've had, if someone's had testing many years ago. Um, there was a, this question keeps coming up. Would, uh, in terms of uh, inheriting the disease, does this disease skip generations um, if it's if it's heritable? So it depends um, what people mean by skipping generations. The genes don't skip. So if you have a grandfather that had Marfan syndrome, and then he has a grandson that has Marfan syndrome. And they both test positive for the FBN1 variant that causes Marfan syndrome. The dad or the parent between those two generations will for sure have the same variant. The variant does not skip generations, but you can certainly have variable expressivity, meaning how you present. And we think it's probably because you're probably getting other genetic feedback from your other parent that's like protecting you or making you worse. And so they might not have, like you might have a grandparent and a child that have aortic aneurysm and the person in between does not. So it, it can skip generations on how it presents, but won't skip um, generations on the genetics. Like once, if, if you didn't pass the variant down to your child, that child cannot pass it further. Right. Right. I think another sort of interesting question that I came across is how do, so let's say, you know, you're the parent of a child with one of these conditions and let's say your child's care team is not really certain of what to do. Would you recommend a certain pathway through which, you know, these families can get connected to experts? Would it be really, you know, referring to the guidelines that will come out soon? Hopefully that will kind of provide a lot of clarity in the future to lots of healthcare providers. Yeah, I think it's a combination. We, we mark throughout the guidelines and it's a statement technically instead of guidelines, but we, um, to work with aortopathy specialist, I think it's really important because these diseases are so rare and certainly they can get guidance from the statement and long-term care from the statement. But I certainly, especially if it's one of the more severe aggressive conditions would seek out either the physician reaching out and saying, can you help me manage this patient or having the family come? I mean, we follow tons of families that see us every one or two years that are from other states and other, even other countries, but primarily follow with a different cardiologist just come with us to seek advice. And probably once a week, like I get calls and I know a lot of my colleagues do to say, what would you do in this situation? So I think for both the families and the providers should be willing to reach out and get support. I mean, this is every rare disease. Like there are, you know, you just can't know everything. And to be honest, the parents become a lot of the experts. And so I think encouraging your medical team to reach out. And of course, families can always reach out. Not that they have to change. You know, if you're in Georgia, you don't have to like change providers and move to a different state. 
but maybe you say, Hey, can you reach out to this person? Or do you know an expert near me that specializes? Georgia was a bad example because they have Atlanta, which has a fantastic center, but you know what I mean? In a smaller area. Perfect. And I also just wanted to throw in there a Lily and Lai. I believe that's how you pronounce their name. Jeff said in the q and I don't know if you can see this, Dr. Morris, that they just operated on a patient with um, aortopathy and pre oh, So good to know. Yeah, if, uh, you know, that's good to know. I would love to hear about that. <laughs> correspondence. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Lillian. Yes, and uh, I also think that, uh, you know, it's um, patients have got in touch with us asking us how early to start blood pressure medications. And I know you covered that in your topic, but what would be the earliest uh, if if a patient has uh, aortic, you know, has a risk of aortic disease, but maybe no underlying genetic cause? Right. Well, if you know, the only way we'd know they had a risk of aortic disease is if they have a dilated aorta, if they don't have genetics. Um, you know, we, I don't think there's a benefit of waiting. And I think part of it is that they get labeled as blood pressure medicines. And even though they are blood pressure medicines, we're not using them to control the blood pressure. Kids yeah. by, by mostly have totally normal blood pressures and re repeated trials have shown that they're effective in controlling aortic dilation. So we're not, you know, I think sometimes people think we're, con we're controlling the blood pressure to control the dilation, but we think it has benefits above and beyond that of actually reducing stress on the vessels. And I mean, if it was my kid, I would start on day one of life. I mean, we give, and I think people get nervous because they're giving young children medications, but I will say like, I'm a fetal cardiologist too, right? And so sometimes this is totally unrelated to aortic disease, but sometimes babies get arrhythmias inside the mom. It's called supraventricular tachycardia. It's actually really common. We see, you know, five or 10 a year. And to treat those babies, we give mothers propranolol, which is a beta blocker. It goes through the placenta, treats the baby and treats their SVT and we control it. And as soon as the babies are born, we give the babies propranolol and it controls their SVT and does great. We keep them on it for a year In a year we take them off if their arrhythmias have stopped. And propranolol is what we treat babies with Marfan syndrome with, you know, and so, but we have used it for decades and very safe. And so certainly I understand if families want to wait to think about it, that's always their prerogative, but I don't think there's, you know, there's not like a magical time to start. And every paper that's been done to date says the earlier, the better. The biggest time of aortic growth is from age zero to two and then puberty. So that's when you get, you know, you, you can grow a few centimeters in your aorta or a few, not centimeters, but like at least a centimeter in those periods. Right. Another question that was just yeah. Um, it regards essentially, so an adolescent with a dilated root is prescribed a tenolol. The question is, should the patient push their doctor to consider dual therapy if perhaps the doctor only prescribes a monotherapy? And if it helps the very, in this specific case, is SMAD3. Oh, that's tricky because SMAD3 is so mild. I think it would really depend on the size of the aorta. I think certainly bring it up in a conversation and seeing um, what you want to do. I'd say like personally for me, anyone who's moderate to severely dilated, I will offer dual therapy. Not everyone will do that. And then for mild, I rarely do dual unless I have a really risky family history or a, or a parent that just wants to be very aggressive. You know, I have parents that have been traumatized by their own aortic surgery when they were 20 and they'll say, Hey, I know, I know it's harder to do dual therapy. Like I think dual therapy is totally safe, but um, I, I really like to do this and I'll, I'll partner with them on that. But I think if, SMAD3 typically is very mild. I would usually only use monotherapy, but if it was SMAD3 with, with significant dilation, I definitely would bring it up with them. And if they don't want to do it, talk to them about why, why they don't, but it may just not be indicated because the disease isn't severe enough yet. Sorry. Yeah, there are two questions that, uh, that are outside of connective tissue disorders, I think. One is uh, this one came in the Q&A. So is the middle-aged adult male diagnosed with plymalgia rheumatica with aortic aneurysm? Should further genetic testing be done or could the PMR be the sole cause for this uh, uh, aortic aneurysm? Oh, that's really interesting. I don't know. I don't, in that specific rheumatic disorder, I don't know of aortic disease, but I am a a pediatric provider and that's an older person disease. So I'd have to look it up there. Um, and I see this from Stacia. I know Stacia really well. Hello. Um, and say hi to Rose for me. Um, the, so 
I would definitely consider testing to make sure lots of people have dual diagnoses. So I would make sure there's not an aortic, gen, a genetic aortopathy for sure. I wouldn't just assume, but if right. genetic testing is positive, I was telling um, Christiane and Mauda earlier that we know that SSA antibodies, which are common in Sjogren's syndrome, which is a an autoimmune syndrome kind of like lupus, that mothers can pass those to their babies and the babies can have dilated aortas just from those antibodies. And so um, I think it's certainly possible that aortic dilation is seen in certain rheumatologic disorders, but I would, I would work anyone of a young age um, under 60 with a significant aortic aneurysm might work up genetically. Yeah, so that was the other thing I was going to ask was the undifferentiated uh, connective tissue disorder, which is, which is a, a autoimmune disorder. And if if uh, the child is seen with an aortic aneurysm, if they should get genetic testing, but I think you've addressed it. With yeah, and I probably would, unless they had like the, the one clear time we know that there's probably not a need is in this, it, we call it neonatal lupus, but it's when the mother carries antibody, the SSA antibodies, um, yeah. which usually cause Sjogren and they get pregnant while they're having those antibodies and the baby typically has heart block. It's an arrhythmia. Right. Um, and then they get a really dilated aorta that like 80% of them have a dilated aorta. And we don't, I don't think in those cases we need to do genetic testing, but in any other inflammatory autoimmune condition, I probably would consider it if you have at least moderate dilation. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, Dr. Morris, you said uh, patients with such conditions or even with uh, bicuspid aortic valves could have uh, aort enlargement of the aorta. Would someone with BAV and enlargement of the aorta undergo genetic testing? What are the recommendations for genetic testing in that? Oh, yes. This is very controversial. So BAV stands for bicuspid aortic valve. So bicuspid aortic valve is the most common congenital heart defect. It's in present, present in one to two percent of the entire population. It's where instead of the leaflet, the normal aortic valve should look like yeah. three leaflets. It should look like a Mercedes sign. Yes. But this is when two of those leaflets are fused and you get bicuspid valve. And it's really about 70% of them will have aortic dilation of some port naturally. But they certainly have an increased risk of dissection. So the question is when to do genetic testing. There's not great evidence. It's sort of all over the place. And so um, most people I know won't do it just with if you just have aortic dilation with BAV, but you need something else. So either the aortic dilation needs to be severe, like a Z-score above four or a root or a dimension above four centimeters, or they need to have other features like connective tissue features or family history of dissection or family history of BAV, but you need BAV plus one other thing, either severe dilation or like another feature that increases your risk is what that's still, even in the statement, you'll see we're kind of danced around it. We're like, consider these situations, but uh, there's a lot of strong opinions across the, the spectrum in BAV because it's so common. If we start recommending genetic testing and all BAV, that's, you know, 2% of the population of the world. So we can't. <laughs> do yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. We're really looking forward to the consensus statement that <laughs> that is great news for pediatric management of heritable aortic disorders. Uh, I know we are on the, we are over past the hour, Mora. Is there any other pressing question that you'd like to ask? The only one I saw, which is is a quick one, someone was asking, they have acted to, their child does not. How should the child be surveilled? And I also hear this a lot when talking with patients and families. So just something that maybe you could clear up. Yeah, if for sure the child has been genetically tested and is negative, there's no reason that patient needs to be followed by a cardiologist, then they're negative. Now, sometimes what I see is people tell me they don't have it and they just had imaging and they don't have a dilated aorta. That's very different. They need the genetic testing. But if the genetic testing is negative, there's no need for surveillance. They're, they do not have ACT2, so are not at risk of an aneurysm from that in any way. Great, thank you so much. Sure. Great, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Morris, for your time. Uh, to be with us today and to address so many questions from, from our community today. Um, I just wanted to say that this session has been re is recorded and it will be available on the GADA and the JRF YouTube channels. If uh, we didn't get to your questions or if you have more questions from just this talk, uh, please feel free to uh, send us an email either to GADA or the JRF the, this is our contact information and stay tuned for a post event survey as well as the webinar recording when it becomes available. 
Uh, thank you once again, Dr. Morris. It was uh, a pleasure to have you here and an absolute uh, informational uh, talk from you. Thank you so much. And no thanks, problem. Maura. <laughs> thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank, thank you. you so much for having me.